Professor Chris Philo uh, gained a first degree in geography from Cambridge University. He was then a PhD student and a research fellow in Cambridge before he got a lecturing post in the Department of Geography at the University of Wales. Uh, Professor Philo was appointed to a chair in geography at the University of Glasgow in 1995. Um, as well as being um, an editor in progress in human geography, Professor Philo's ongoing research interests concern the historical, cultural, and rural geographies of mental ill health. Uh, and he's brought together much of his research on uh, madness and asylums in his book, A Geographical History of Institutional Provision for the Insane from Medieval Times uh, to the 1960s in England and Wales. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm more used to introducing um, talks that have titles like Ethical Dilemmas in Medicine, um, but this year, we're re really branching out, and we had a talk on concerning beards, um, uh, facial health, and hygiene in Britain, 1650 to 1900. Um, and the speaker was able to find a lot of good examples on the walls around us. And I don't know whether the beards talk or uh, tonight's talk has the most unusual title. But anyway, uh, Professor Philo is now going to talk to us on cats robbed him of his wealth, his health, and his reason, the wild and tranquil geographies of animals and madness. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Ian, for that introduction. And it really is a pleasure to be here. I feel slightly nervous in this very large, grand room, but I'll see what I can do. Okay, so the materials I'm going to talk about today derive from over a decade of work. The fact that I haven't finished the work and I haven't published yet maybe tells us something. But nonetheless, I'm going to give it a go, another kind of presentation, another attempt to play through this material. This may be a slightly meandering paper, fragments of an argument perhaps, knitting together two of my prime academic interests. Mental health geographies, or more specifically, historical geographies of madness, asylums and psychiatry, and animal geographies, or more specifically, historical geographies of the relations between humans and animals. The specific focus is Lewis Wayne an artist known for his cat drawings who experienced serious mental health problems in later life and was committed to a series of lunatic asylums. I want to use this story as a window on what I call the entangled geographies of animals and madness, of wildness and tranquility. And just to show how on top of the zeitgeist I am, apparently there's a film coming out about Lewis Wayne with Benedict Cumberbatch and Claire Foy. So I'm totally ahead of the curve here. I'm usually a long, long way behind it, but, but here I'm pioneering. The immediate prompt for my paper, for my work here, was an article that I stumbled upon from the Vancouver Daily Province magazine from March 1950. Don't ask me why I was reading that. And don't worry about the potter wasps, the things in the middle. They, they don't have anything to do with this talk, I don't think. Let me show you a little bit of the text, a bit more detail. Down here, we have the statement, Katz had indeed robbed him of his wealth, his health, and his reason, which gives me the title, the main title of my talk for today. And over here, we have another bit of text, which reads, until his tragic death, Wayne was confined in a mental home. And in his lucid moments, he said that Katz had accursed him. Can it be possible that Katz had the power to send Lewis Wayne to a living death? Meaning the living death of madness, of serious mental ill health sequestered in a large asylum away from all he knew 
and loved. It's obviously a somewhat fanciful populist account, and my research does not really support the claim that Wayne complained of being cursed by cats. But all the same, this little article spurred my interest. It spurred the fragments of inquiry that I will now relate. Let me begin with a very brief outline of Wayne's life. But I want to acknowledge immediately my debts to two prior studies. Rodney Dale's 1968 monograph, Lewis Wayne, The Man Who Drew Cats, an exceedingly rich source, and Patricia Aldridge's 2000 coffee table book, The Cats of Lewis Wayne, with a very useful introductory essay. For my paper today, though, I supplement these secondary sources with detailed examinations of Wayne's own drawings and writings, and also, perhaps my most original contribution, archival contribution, a consultation of Wayne's case notes when at Bethlehem Hospital, 1925 to 1930, which are not available to Dale or seemingly Aldridge either. The case notes, I should say, when in Knapsbury Hospital, 1930 to 1939, he died at Knapsbury, uh, do not apparently survive. So, born 5th of August 1960, 1860 I should say, Clerkenwell, London, died 4th of July 1939, Knapsbury Hospital in Hertfordshire. Seemingly a shy, retiring, otherworldly, if not always gentle man, he lived much of his life with five sisters, none of whom married, and one or two of them clearly had their own mental difficulties. Briefly, he was married to an older woman, Emily Richardson, 1884 to 1887. I bet that's what the film's going to be about. Briefly, he worked overseas in New York, 1907 to 1909. He's remembered then as this British artist and cartoonist who specialised in cats and other animals. But he seemed particularly compelled to sketch cats. It does seem like a strange compulsion. Thousands of illustrations will be found everywhere in the later 1800s, the early 1900s. Children's books and magazines were littered with them. His own annuals published 1901 to 1915, postcards, advertisements, and much more. In some quarters, he's regarded as a key figure in the history of cats in Britain, a key figure in sort of transforming cats from vermin to pets, or companion animals, as we might call them now animals to be homed with humans, normalising cats, as Aldrich puts it, real and permanent place in the home. Partly through his presidency of the National Cat League, 1810, and through writings on what he called practical pussyology. Here are just some examples of these various styles of cat depiction. Some are more naturalistic, some are more cartoonish, some are more stylized. He was called the Hogarth of the cat world. He was also called a one-idea artist. Changes in how he drew his cats have, as we will see, sometimes been interpreted for what they reveal about his so-called descent into madness. Once into his 60s, during the 1920s, he developed serious mental health problems, and he was sent to a succession of lunatic asylums, public and charitable, about which more shortly. A broad agreement in the secondary literature is that he, he showed signs of an eccentric personality, a schizoid personality, emerging during the 1910s, which became full-blown schizophrenia by circa 1922 to 1924, albeit the case note data might not so easily support such post hoc diagnosing. There is, though, this mythology, okay? This clear mythology that cats hold the key to explaining Wayne's madness. In which regard, two basic claims are advanced. One is to do with a cat called Peter. And we see two illustrations of Peter here. Peter was a cat that was owned by Wayne and by his wife. His wife, she died. She had cancer, she was very sick, very unwell, and she died. Peter was a seemingly a comfort to both of them during this time. And certainly, Wayne and Peter grew very, very close. It also seems, though, that Peter becomes kind of like a trigger for malignant sadness, particularly when Peter himself dies. If anything, Wayne seems to be more upset by Peter's death 
in 1898 than by Emily's. A second point here is that a cat was supposedly responsible for the fall that may have played some role in his ensuing ill health. This was a slip when getting onto an omnibus in 1914. It clearly was quite serious, led to a, a serious head injury. Allegedly, the omnibus had swerved to avoid a cat. Let me then sort of, I'm, I'm kind of building a narrative here, but let me now break and insert some of the archival material. Here I particularly mean the, the case note material from the Bethlehem archive. Here is Wayne's admission document. It tells that he's admitted in 24th of August, 1925. He's a transfer from Springfield Mental Hospital, one of the Surrey public county lunatic asylums, now tending to be renamed hospitals, where he'd been for just over a year. It said that the date of age of his first attack was when he was 63, two years, two months ago, but now he's only 64. There's something there about the, the timings that don't quite work so well. The supposed cause of insanity on this document is recorded as unknown. There's a note here that he's shown violence to his sister. The two medical certificates accompanying the mission form are revealing of delusions, of obsessions, and a clear sense of being persecuted by his family, and these disturbing hints of becoming violent, especially towards his sister Claire. Dr. John Spinway talks about there being gangs of spirits going about projecting currents. He's collecting and secreting, secreting? secreting all the scraps of metal that he can find. That may have something to do with his obsession with electricity and magnetism. He says the sisters are out of their minds, say that they've been taking his checks, uh, thinks the electricity of the cinema has taken the electricity out of his sister's brains. He took Claire Wayne by the throat, pulled her out of the house in a fit of temper. He's changed from being a mild-mannered man to an obstinate, violent man. In the consultant's report, probably produced quite soon after admission. This is also fascinating. Uh, we have here a suspicion of going over to the artistic side, as if somehow that sort of is going to make you more prone to madness. There's a reference to the 1914 incident when he fell under a bus and had concussion. Most intriguingly, though, is the history of the present attack, which includes the hint that cats Okay, so cats get a mention here in the formal documentation, if you like, may have some significance in connection with Wayne's mental ill health. The text in red, he nursed the lady, that was his wife who died for two years, and in that time became fond of cats. A success in Illustrated London News, obviously an illustration of a cat, forced him financially to, and I think the word in the, the handwritten text here is reliance on cat painting. So there's almost a, a hint there that maybe he resented this reliance on cat painting, but I, I don't think that's really necessarily borne out. And there's a lot of other interesting material in this uh, consultant's report that I don't have time to go into now. The diagnosis at the bottom, though, puzzles me, because this is a, a term, and maybe people in the room will know what this is. I've, I've tried, looked it up, tried to Google it, paraphilania. I'm not really sure what that is, and maybe we could talk about that later, uh, the prognosis is nonetheless poor. Also, in terms of gleanings from the archive, we can have a look at the ongoing case notes. They become increasingly brief over the years because it doesn't seem like very much is changing. We hear about, within one week of a mission, a man of 64 with quiet, old-world manners and dress. We hear something more about the accident in 1914. We hear about how, owing to the war, the market for its work was becoming more restricted, which suggests that sort of financial difficulties, becoming suspicious and irritable delusions of 
persecution. What's particularly interesting, though, I like about this bit, and this sort of ties in with some stuff I'm going to talk about towards the end of the lecture, if I actually have time, it says, it implies that the atmosphere of his previous institution, Springfield, had actually, uh, the complete change of environment from home to Springfield, had stimulated him to creative work, approaching somewhat the standard of his earlier days, where it hints here that the present surroundings in Bethlehem, his executive technique has largely deteriorated. This is slightly contradicted in some of the later case notes. There's lots of references him, to him working. His work is his painting, his drawing, his painting, particularly of these cats. In, I think, uh, 1425, uh, somebody says he seems to have lost very little of his technique, which appears to contradict something that was said uh, before. Anyway, there's lots of stuff here about him continuing with the painting. There's a reference uh, about keeping busy, occupied with his painting which seems to be, and here there seems to be some debate amongst the specialists as to whether his art is improving or not, which seems to be somewhat cruder and perhaps more bizarre than his earlier work. Again, I don't really need to go through the details. He ends up being discharged by committee uh, in 1930 and uh, not improved, and about a month and a bit later, he ends up being admitted to uh, Natsbury Hospital, which is one of the Middlesex asylums out, uh, as it happens, in Hertfordshire and I'll say more about Knapsbury uh, later on. So, returning in a way to sort of the narrative, let's go back to the mythology of the cat. His cat drawings of his later years, and this has been hinted at, but sort of in a contradictory way in some of the material I've just presented, supposedly became wilder with his madness or it became more abstract, producing what his sisters used to refer to as his wallpaper rubbish. Now, there's an image up here, which I'll point to. Given the evocative title, The Fire of the Mind Agitates the Atmosphere, was produced while at Bethlehem, perhaps reflecting views that Wayne held about the innate electricities in human and animal bodies, being able to influence, for good or possibly for ill, the minds and bodies of others. It's said that in later life, his right hand would snatch the pen from his left and start drawing wild, hostile, crazy cats, as if his right hand would be hostile and crazy and wild cats, his left hand would be peaceful and tranquil cats. This is it suggested, though, possibly a journalistic intervention from around about 1931. Now, quite a few of you may know something about this series of paintings. They've been, these illustrations here are actually used for this, uh, kind of like the, the flyer, the advert for this particular lecture course. Lecture course, this particular lecture. So there are six of them, and they're often put in a sequence which seem to imply, okay, in the interpretation by Eric Gutman and Walter Maclay, who actually looked after an artistic collection at Bethlehem, that, that we are actually depicting here, we're ca capturing in these illustrations a descent into madness, a descent from sort of quite naturalistic cats through wild cats, through increasingly wild or at least abstracted or pixelated cats. I mean, however you interpret these, I don't think you can straightforwardly say it somehow goes from tranquil to wild. It maybe goes from more naturalistic to more abstract. But it's a big debate as to whether these are actually from, if you like, a, a chronology as to when these are actually dated because we're not quite sure when they were done. They've been, been put in this order to imply a chronology and imply some kind of changing mental state, but it's not entirely clear that that's the case. And I'm not, I don't actually want to dwell on that, even though you'll find lots of websites which spend hours and hours dwelling on precisely this sequence and how we should understand it. I'm perhaps more interested in other things other ways in which cats and madness intersect in Wayne's world. And I want to think about the madness and the saneness of cats. For instance, Wayne himself reckoned that cats were prone to brain disease. Dale talks of Wayne's hobby house, hobby horse, being the weak brain of the cat, a phrase in a newspaper article from 1909. Cats are often driven mad or imbecile by excessive punishment or fright something he wrote in 1895. They're apparently easily confused by new surroundings, prompting mental collapse from something he wrote in 1902. 
So cats can themselves go mad, and I'll come back to that point later on. But what Wayne clearly also argued for was the therapeutic benefit of the human proximity to cats, prompted in particular by Peter. Wayne remarked in a piece from 1896 on how he often felt the benefit of a half-hour chat with Peter, with my Peter. In the same piece, he suggested that no keeper of cats suffer nervous complaints of a minor sort. So cats are supposedly alleviating nervous complaints. And there's also kind of this scientific argument going on, or quite a quasi-scientific argument. It was fascinated by the likes of Tesla and Hertz. He thought about cats as being like these small electrical batteries, which were able to feed energy into larger ones, these larger electrical batteries, which are humans, in, in a way that actually might re-energize the human and give benefit to the human and improve the mental and physical conditions of the human. All of this is contained in various bits and pieces of his writings. So a sort of a semi-coherent, we might think it's delusional, but a semi-coherent kind of intellectual system begins to emerge wherein he understands cats as these therapeutic little batteries. And another front, Bethlehem's archive includes a few enticing hints. There are a sequence of postcards over here called Taking the Waters, thought to be done around about 1930, when Wayne himself was institutionalised. These are sort of cats undergoing some kind of hydrotherapy or, or, or some other kinds of treatments at some kind of retreat, perhaps some kind of asylum in the country, uh, and they're clearly being dealt with. Uh, their nervous afflictions are being dealt with, and we have various things like the, the steam bath here with the, the evil cat nurse. And I particularly like this illustration. This is... Cats positioned uh, as phrenologists, or one's a phrenologist and, and one's having his head examined, and you've got sort of cat phrenological diagrams in the background. So cats here being positioned, if you like, in contexts that hint at mental health settings of one form or another, and, and possibly, too, hints for cynicism about mental health or psy professions and their spaces of activity. So in a broader sense, then, it could be claimed that my discussion of Wayne so far points to a few emerging themes. Specifically, cats, animals, particularly cats, contributing to a person's lapse into madness, as well as possibly being prone to a form of madness themselves. Then we've got a theme of animals, specifically cats, serving as therapeutic resources in combating a person's madness. And companion other animals as such therapeutic resources is actually now something that's really quite a hot topic in many circles. In short, then, we do have a window on the entangled relations of animals and madness. But, and this is where I can't resist my own obsessions, what of the geographies involved in these entanglings? The geographers, the geographies rather, that I as a geographer, if a rather odd one perhaps, feel compelled always to seek out. How might what I'm going to call now mad and animal geographies meet in the Wayne story? So, to set my compass, for the remainder of my presentation, let me specify two building blocks for what follows, two substantive lenses, issues, processes, phenomena, call it what you will, that are indeed the basis for what follows. The first of these, there's a little illustration there that captures them, but the first of these is the ruralisation of the asylum. This was the drive to locate, in some cases to relocate, asylums of all kinds, of all stripes, to the countryside, particularly the pastoral countryside, not some kind of distant wilderness countryside. Reflecting really quite genuine therapeutic beliefs in the value of retreating to nature 
And that phrase, retreat, of course, means so much in the history of British mental health institutions, psychiatry. The retreat, the 1790s foundation in York by the Tukes being so important here, deliberately retreating from the urban industrial complications and overstimulations of the city of York. So they were genuine therapeutic beliefs. They were medical and they were also moral. The Tukes talked about moral treatment. There were possibly elements too of a police action, what I call a police action, you know, a wish to, to get oh, these quite difficult, awkward folks out of our cities. You can find elements of that too, but I don't want to, I certainly would not be someone who'd want to reduce this move of the asylum out from the city into the countryside as a police action, and that's all that we have to say about it, okay? I think there's far more that we need to say about it. Secondly, the ruralization of livestock and some other animals too, spurred by emergent medical, moral, and what I term discomfort arguments, especially around live meat markets and slaughterhouses, a discourse and a practice begins to emerge that starts to push, particularly livestock animals, out of the city. But also, other animals too become out of place, and particularly here, dogs. Feral dogs, stray dogs, rabid dogs, sometimes of course known as mad dogs which is interesting, like a fusion here. You think about the rabid dog as the mad dog. So, two building blocks. Ruralization of the asylum, ruralization of livestock animals. Now, this presentation is not really meant to be about centralizing me or my own work, but having said that, what I've just laid out are two of my own obsessions. Two of my own obsessions with the ruralization of the asylum, on the one hand, and the ruralization of livestock animals on the other. And as shameless self-promotion, I just put up some uh, items, if you like, from my own publications. This indeed is the big 2004 book that was referred to, a, a very long book about as long and interesting as a telephone directory, uh, a geographical history, blah, blah, blah. The title should have been A Space Reserve for Insanity, which is a, a paraphrase from Michel Foucault, but uh, the publishers wanted to put that as a subtitle. So this is a very long book, and I spent absolutely ages in this book churning through every last detail of the arguments that were made and the practices that resulted with respect to asylum ruralization. Okay, that's the central theme. It's not the only theme, a lot of other themes, but that is a very central theme. And ever since my, basically my first publication, I think my first long publication, 1987, Fit Localities for Asylum, it started to explore that. That's a very, very long time ago. That's ancient history for many people. But I've also done a lot of work on Livestock animals, the idea of getting livestock animals and getting the slaughterhouses that uh, end the lives of those livestock animals out of the city. A piece that I originally published in 1995 and was republished in 1998, Animals, Geography in a City, and it's something I published really quite recently, I think even earlier this year, with a Canadian scholar called Ian McLaughlin, uh, The Strange Case of the Missing Slaughterhouse Geographies. So in other words, all of this does tie quite closely back to my own particular fields of interest. But that's not really that important. What is a little bit more important is this additional platform for some of the things that I'm going to say as I wind through the later stages of this lecture. And that's to talk about very direct empirical connections between animal and asylum ruralization through two routes, both of which I talk about exhaustively and exhaustingly in my book. One is moral citing principles, moral after moral treatment, okay? And I just want to, just to capture this, I want to put up a long quote from somebody called Dr. J.C. Bucknell. He was the medical superintendent of the Devon uh, County Lunatic Asylum. He was also a long-term editor of the Asylum Journal of Mental Science that was a forerunner of the British Journal of Psychiatry. He says, if birds, flowers and pictures influence beneficially the mind and temper of the patient in the corridors of, and here he's referencing Bethlehem, town girt Bethlehem, stuck in the middle of London. What rich and fruitful influences might not be expected from the garden and the fields, from the domestic animals with whom even madmen form friendships? 
and from the free creatures who afford him delight. If a picture, here Bucknell means a picture of an animal or a plant, can give pleasure to the mind distraught, how much more may be expected from an hourly intimacy with the bounteous and beautiful forms of nature? So, a subcomponent of asylum ruralisation, the drive to, to ruralise the asylum, was to put the asylum, the asylum dwellers, in contact with nature, and that includes with the animals that make up nature. Not the big, wild, scary animals, but it could be smaller, more, if you like, friendly animals, birds, squirrels. But it also could mean domesticated animals. It could mean cats, it could mean dogs, but it, it could also mean sheep and cows. And a second dimension here is that of asylum farm colonies. I expect some of you will be aware that a huge drive in the 19th century was to make the asylums into these self-sufficient farm colonies so that they would have large, they might, might grow crops, they'd certainly grow vegetables, but they would have lots and lots of animals that they would themselves slaughter. Or they would get slaughtered, but they would be basically the foodstuffs for the asylum. Some medical superintendents forgot about being medical superintendents and basically began to think of themselves as the, the managers of, of prosperous farm businesses. They were even looking to turn a profit. And there was actually like quite a lot of criticism in things like the parliamentary reports by the lunacy commissioners about those asylums that actually became too obsessed with farm economy. Interesting, though, this, this sort of combination of the asylum and the farm. It's really nicely captured in this postcard. This is a postcard which represents an asylum, okay? The Worcester, Massachusetts State Asylum, okay, for the insane. There's not an asylum building in sight. It's called Pasture View, but nonetheless, this is very much part of the asylum, all right? So, the second dimension of this connection between madness and animals is indeed livestock animals which are in the farm colony asylum. And let me just underline something, though. I've hinted at it. But the emphasis here is very much on, if you like, putting asylums in these pastoral, pastoral, tranquil, domesticated locations. The animals are supposed to be tranquil and domesticated. The locations are supposed to be tranquil and domesticated. So this is not wild countryside. This is not wildness, wilderness. This is something else again. It's a kind of an interim set of spaces between the city and let's say the wilderness. So hold that in mind. Which brings me back to Wayne. Let's consider the asylums to which Wayne was committed. Springfield, that's at the top there, that was opened in 1841. It was the first Surrey public county asylum set in a, a big estate, Springfield Park, uh, Tooting, London Borough of Wandsworth. Then it was very much out in the countryside. You can see that from an aerial photograph, but to some extent it's been overtaken now by urban growth, which is true of a lot of the asylums, which why many of them were actually, actually being pushed to relocate because they were being, if you like, caught up by an expanding city fabric. Bethlehem. Bethlehem moved from very cramped quarters in London, north of the Thames, in 1815 to Lambeth, just south of the Thames. But throughout the 19th century, Bethlehem is under pressure to relocate again. There are amazingly vicious debates occurring in rooms such as this, saying that Bethlehem is not a proper mental hospital if it remains where it is. To be a proper mental hospital, it actually needs to relocate again. And it doesn't do that until, interestingly, 1930, the year that uh, Wayne leaves to go somewhere else. Maybe that's why he had to leave to go somewhere else, when Bethlehem actually does move south uh, to Beckingham. All of these institutions, though, and Knapsbury is the one I'll come on to in a moment. Knapsbury is in Hertfordshire. That's out in the countryside. I'll say something about that in a moment. All of them are caught up in the orthodoxy that a mental hospital worth its name has to be sited in the countryside. All were... A escaping from, or being encouraged to escape from, the choking urban landscapes of London. I've just put in a caveat here, because already by the 
end of the 19th century, start of the 20th century, there was a lot of suspicion about these sort of moral therapeutic arguments about the merits of the, the countryside and so on and so forth. But the, if you like, the, the driver to asylum, to ruralise the asylum system was still in place, even though many specialists were beginning to doubt it, particularly ones associated, unsurprisingly, with Bethlehem. Now, Wayne, well, he himself offers an intriguing sidelong glance at animals and the asylum ruralisation agenda. Firstly, because he himself internalised an anti-urbanism. He clearly did. He reckoned the urban to be fundamentally damaging to psychology and behaviour. And there's all kinds of evidence to support this claim including in his writings. And then we have things like his wish as a child, to, this is from Rodney Dale, to escape the confines of London to the country, climbing trees, collecting insects, snake hunting. We hear about his love of country shows. He felt that the fresh country air gave him the strength to go on. We hear about his very negative response to New York. There's a, there's a lot I could say about that. But a ringing phrase is that it is quite abnormal. And I could elaborate his anti-urbanism. But I suppose what I'm wanting to stress, because this is, in a sense, more the novelty of Wayne, there are also tantalising hints that he regarded the city as maddening for animals. He was very worried about those New York cats, for instance, living in basements and cellars. He talked about the problem of these underground cats in these unnatural environments, cats that were likely to go mad likely to stray, likely to become a danger to themselves and others. And what I've tried to do, and I can only give you a taste of this today, is to, to think about how his anti-urbanism and how it traces through in his views on cats and other animals becoming mad in the city, becoming themselves mentally distressed, as it were, in the cities, is, is, is captured in some of his artwork and some of his writings. I've put up two illustrations here. And we might want to compare this one, rural, relatively speaking, nice hilly background, nice riverine setting, with a, this nice little calm cat in the foreground, with this. In 1902, he ran a little series called The Kit Cats, a five-part serial in something called The Ladies Magazine. The iconography here unmistakably sets cats looking worried, looking nervous perhaps, in a polluted, troubled, blackened cityscape. Another example, cats, if you like, in a kind of urban anarchy. This is undated, and I took it from Aldridge's coffee table collection. Remember what Wayne had said about the weak brain of the cat. It's likely to slip into madness or imbecility if overstimulated by a complex, chaotic, noisy, smelly set of environmental surroundings. To some extent, this image captures perhaps something of that sensibility. Another illustration. I think this was in one of his annuals. You can't really read this, but it's called The Country Labourer's Ideal. And what it is, is actually lots and lots of cats bemoaning the boring life of the rural cat and wishing that they could go to town. Now, on face value, you might say, well, actually, this is Wayne expressing there's a problem with rural life and actually urban life is preferable. But what I think it's doing is a little more subtle. That I think he's, he's actually worrying about these cats and worrying about others, rural dwellers, human rural dwellers, perhaps, who are seduced by the city, who are attracted by the city, the bright lights of the city. And because of all the consequences that may follow if they do end up going to the city. So I think in various ways this is actually not a pro-urban, but actually an anti-urban tract as well. A bit more fancifully, I'll show you it, because this actually is a nice archival gleaning. This is taken from the archive. An alarmed-looking cat over here, startled and alarmed-looking cat over here, on the back of a folded sheet of note paper, evidently taken from somewhere called Horrocks's Hotel in central London, in what strikes 
as a, a busy urban setting. That's obviously not his own drawing. That's actually the, the, the Horrocks drawing, the, the drawing that the hotel has on its notepaper. Thought to date from about 1895. Secondly, though, There is this suggestion that Wayne improves when he goes to the asylum, and particularly to the more rural asylums, Springfield, and then, as we'll see in a moment, Knapsbury. Remember that little hint in the consultant's report about how he'd actually improved when he went to Springfield? His drawing came back, blah, 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 but it actually seemed to have deteriorated again at Bethlehem. It's an intriguing little hint. Initially, of Bethlehem. His cats has drawn, become more wild, so it's said, they become these strange magnetised beings. But later, they appear to become more domesticated again, more naturalistically cat-like, while he's at Bethlehem and then particularly, as I say in a moment, when he goes to Knapsbury. Alan Beveridge, in a short piece in 2006 in the British Journal of Psychiatry, wonders if this was due to pressures to produce more commercial work again to support his sisters. And so maybe, we, we can't be too fanciful about this, maybe it is, is, is something else going on. It's not actually some kind of process, if you like, internal to his own psychodynamics. There could be other factors in play as well. But there are really quite wonderful, tantalising hints about... Wayne at Knapsbury, okay, in this asylum which is, uh, again, out in the countryside. And I'll say a tiny bit more about that in a minute. I've got an image. And it's tantalising hints that he's kind of settling down with cats at Knapsbury. There's a beguiling link here to a claim made by Aldridge about a thriving cat colony at Knapsbury. A Daily Express article, the 2nd of October, 1934, spoke of Wayne's studio now being an asylum and goes on to say, perhaps a week will go by and he will not draw a line. Then one day he will take a piece of bread from the asylum table, go out into the grounds and coax the stray cats that frequent them to sit for him. And it's a sequence of paintings, another sequence of paintings, which are sometimes called the Naps We Cats paintings. They hold pride of place uh, in the St Albans Museum. There are several of these in St Albans Museum, and I'll show you one of those in a moment. And then, of course, we have, as I say, this connection between those pictures and the Knapsbury cat colony. An odd postscript talks about a ghost of an old woman that now haunts a cottage on the asylum grounds, going around frightening the local dogs and, indeed, this then was Knapsbury, another public county asylum to service Middlesex. Middlesex had a number of these, and a lot of them ended up in a kind of ring of madness. Big, big asylums circling London, the later 19th century into the early 20th century. This one was located near St Albans, actually out in Hertfordshire. It had very extensive grounds, more land than virtually any other English and Welsh asylum, according to British parliamentary papers. The buildings were described as an architectural masterpiece, and there was lots of impressive landscape gardening going on, and this is actually talked about in some detail by Claire Hickman, who is a, a historian of asylum gardens. The cats in the ground may well have indeed been quite numerous. They may have been tolerated, there's a, a lovely little hint in the archive for Knapsbury about uh, the necessity of employing the county rat catcher. Maybe they needed even more cats than they actually had. Here we have a nice picture of Wayne actually in Knapsbury. And here we have a very famous, well, relatively speaking, famous painting that he produced called A Tea Party at Knapsbury. Painted clearly by Wayne in the 1930s one of the top ten objects in the social history collection at St Albans Museum. And it includes, in the background, buildings that most people would agree, who know stuff about this, would agree that, that, that these are sort of depictions of Knapsbury Hospital. But what's very interesting also at this period is the cats themselves. There are brown tabbies, but particularly blue tabbies. 
the Knapsbury cats always seem to include some blue cats. Why? I don't know. It is intriguing. Some other images from this period. There's a painting from 1939, a blue cat holding up a blue kitten. A very curious building in the background, rather ornate Baroque, or is it Asian? I'm not quite sure. We've got a rather nice painting from 1935, proving that he can actually do dogs as well. Shepherd's Sheep Dogs, it's called, who are clearly, again, in the same kind of setting, the hint of the Knapsbury Hospital behind. And then we have here, at the bottom, a landscape. It said that he started to draw more landscapes and paint more landscapes in actually quite a conventional way quite late on in his life. This is undated, unfinished, but it, it looks to me clearly like it's in the Knapsbury series. Moving now towards the finish. Lewis Wayne, Animals in the City. Now, for Wayne, cats should be allowed into city homes. Okay, kind of established that. One of the things that Wayne is all about is the idea that cats should be brought into the home, the human home, wherever that might be. But he is more unsure about other animals, particularly dogs. And he felt that stray dogs should be rounded up. They should be taken to the home for lost dogs in Battersea. And it's clear that he did subscribe to that kind of sanitary discourse that I described earlier, medical and moral, that sought to evict many animals and other kinds of eyesores from the city. He talks about, in a letter of 1905, the necessity for cleaning the nooks and crannies of our streets. It is the foulness of these spots which leads many well-behaved dogs astray from place to place, and no attempt is made to disinfect or clean them. Okay? So there's a sense here in which dogs are becoming infected, they're becoming, perhaps you might say, becoming a bit mad because of the city, these stray dogs. But at root, the twist that he provides, though, with respect to this idea of whether we should get animals out of the city, is that he supposes that it seems, okay, and I've given you sort of fragmentary inferences, there's a lot more material that supports the argument, that he supposed that for many animals, for their own sanity, the own sanity, the sanity of the animals themselves, were best advised to dwell away from the bewildering urban scene. And so I come to my last overhead, where I magically tie everything together, sort of. Wayne hence provides a distinctly, I like to call it, a twisty take on this whole set of problematics. The relocation of madness, asylum ruralisation, and some animals, like livestock animals, perhaps stray dogs too, from the city to the countryside. And what we might say, if you like, scaling up and making more general claims, is that here, for Wayne, and of course he's not the only person, there are others, many, many others, both mad people on the one hand and some animals on the other start to be regarded as troubled and or troubling others. Damaged by, unwanted by the city. Where the city begins to stand in, not the city per se as such, but really stands in for the idea of places of intense but normal, healthy human dwelling and endeavour. So both mad people and some animals too wild for the city, needing to take their wildness elsewhere, or to be tranquil, or, and here I inject a more critical note, tranquilised elsewhere. And again, sort of, with this bigger picture finish, what is going on, I'm suggesting, and there's much, much more to say about this, are rather problematic cross-codings that begin to spring into play, that render, let's say, both the psychiatric patient, perhaps the ex-psychiatric patient, and maybe, if not all, non-companion animals 
as out of place in a city as not wanted if they try to come back into the city. And I hope you kind of get the point about that when we're talking about deinstitutionalization, mental patients, ex-mental patients, if you like, returning to the city with the closure of the big asylums. And then on the other hand, how are cities reacting to all kinds of problematic animals that are appearing at our gates? Wayne, I think, provides us with a lens, an interesting, twisty lens. I hope that you've enjoyed my discussion of Wayne, and I hope you kind of get some of the little points I'm trying to make here that branch out to these different geographies of madness on the one hand and animals on the other. Thank you very much indeed.